I would like to make a short presentation just to show how we moved when we started adopting the, the DHIS. And I would like to just go through the approaches we used when we were adopting this system in the country. And uh, briefly, I'll talk about the lessons learned from this system. And there are also some challenges, of course. It was not very easy. I just for as for introduction, I just want to let you know that we decided to use DHIS in 2010. And uh, the reason we did this was because a lot of evaluations had been done on our health information system and uh, recommended many other systems except the one we were using. Meaning the one we were using was we had to do away with it at, at all <laughs> at all costs. So that made us think of the next system. And uh, this presentation just to let you know how we adopted the new system. <coughs> the, the, the thing that motivated us to change and what all these other people were saying from the evaluations is that there were so many systems in the country, <coughs> what we call parallel systems, each one has their own m and system, and they, it became just too crowded. And there was a way of moving towards maybe one that can combine all these parallel systems. And it was very difficult actually to know how far has the health sector achieved because each of these systems were reporting through a different way and we couldn't have a way of knowing that our country is doing like this. So these are the things we thought we could change. And again, our previous reporting system was based on districts only and not necessarily health facilities. So we wanted something that can actually be able to capture the health facility level information for analysis. And the previous system we were using was using Excel forms, and sometimes it was very difficult to really analyze all these Excel forms, especially the issue of linking them. You could link so many files until you don't know where you started with. And so that was often giving us actually different results, even if it was done by the same person. If you linked it again, you still get different results. And I remember the we come here with people from our districts. They used to come to the national level. We show them the results, and then they say, no, this are, these are not our results, but this is ours. So we, we had always differences at meetings. And it was also very difficult for us to give feedback. And so this system, the new system, was able to give direct feedback. In general, there was a lot of talk that I think health information system does not give us any data that we can actually understand. And therefore, there was quite a, a lot of erosion of credibility of our system. And we never used even to be invited to meetings like this. There were better people to come, like the malaria control, the HIV people. As health information system was <laughs> getting forgotten. So when we started the system, we, we would our objective was actually to establish a database that can address the health facility reporting. And this is what we did. We also, in the process, we were to define the standard, what is a district, the national outputs, because now, now we are doing it for the country. And we were also tasked with the idea of linking service delivery to the, in, to the databases, because there are so many other service delivery points but we wanted to link them so that they can talk to each other. And in the, in the process, one of the things we want to think of scaling up ICT use. I think we have the laptops, we have, people are now really thinking about uh, mobile phones and modems. So that was one of the things. And the building of capacity, because we totally, we knew very well we were being supported by technical assistance. And we know this technical assistance will not to always be there. So we wanted to have a very competent team in the country that would do some of the work so that the consultants can have time to go to the other areas that have not started DHIS and we continue it ourselves. And the last one, we thought of having a critical stakeholder support. Because I've mentioned earlier that we had a lot of parallel systems. We wanted to see if we can bring all these stakeholders in one house so that we have one reporting system that can answer to our needs as a country. I'll briefly tell you just the approaches we used in adopting this. 
One was at least having a small committee that will really manage. And we developed a small committee, and quite a number of the committee members are in this room. I was tasked with the, with the job of coordinating the committee, not necessarily being the technical person, but just the easy job of calling for meetings, making sure things move. And then from there we started having stakeholders briefings. We had a lot of meetings with the stakeholders, and of course some of them gave us very great ideas. And then we hired the technical assistant through, we called it a competitive process. Was it really competitive? Because the Oslo people were the only people who were the developers of this. <laughs> but we call it competitive because they won the, the tender that we were, they were brought on board. And we've been working with them for quite a long time. Then after that, we did the system customization where we actually put all the Kenyan forms into the system. And above all, of course, we put the Kenyan flag on the GHIS. <laughs> so that is what we did. From there we did, we started trying to, after putting some of the forms, we thought of trying to go to the district. And we, our first district we went to was Machakos. We have the, the district, the, the records officer for Machakos is here. Yes, I can greet the others. And this is where the philosophy, according to Professor Bra, started. <laughs> because I think he has even written it in his book. Those of you who have a chance to read his book. He has actually put this as a philosophy. Because when we went to Machakos, we were testing the system. We were using the local area network to, to access data. And then unfortunately, there was a, back, a, a, a power blackout. And therefore, we could no longer use the, the local area network. But from there, we decided to, to put up. After that, we put up the, the modems. And to our, we found out the modem was even working faster than the local area network. And that is how the revolution of thinking of actually having a web-based system working. Because from just that day, it was able to see, we were able to show that using a mobile modem network was easier, was even working faster than, than the local area network. And then from there, I think he has also documented in his book, although it doesn't come out clearly, but I can now make it very clear for the people. From there, we made a small tour. We wanted to show these people around the, the region. And there's a place in, in, his, in her region where actually things are opposite. A, if we are going up downhill, if you pour water, the pour will actually go uphill. I think all of you should go there. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then if you put a vehicle even on free, it is able to climb uphill without anything. So, <laughs> Professor Brass said, if, if water can go upwards, and <laughs> then everything is possible. <laughs> and that is the philosophy of going into the, the cloud infrastructure, web-based. Actually, it was a very bold move to say Kenya can now go to the cloud and we can uh, do everything to make sure it works. So that is the philosophy of how it came. It's a nice touristic region. I don't know what the geologists say, why things should go the opposite. But some of them say there's no gravity there, or the gravity is upside down. But I don't, that's not the issue. But the issue is that at least it gave a motivation that even what was being seen as impossible was actually possible. And that is when we thought of actually mounting this DHIS on a central server to be accessed through internet modems. And that's what led to so many other thinking of what can we do? Can we therefore procure modems? Can we do many other things? That's how it started. And then after that, we actually, it was a bit of smooth sailing. We did a pilot. What you call it pilot, but in, in reality, we just wanted to try on a more bigger regional, bigger region. And we came to this province. We, where there were many reasons why we came to the province. Of course, the ocean also has an impact. It is refreshing, but coming next to the ocean was also good. But otherwise, there were very many factors which led to coming to this province. And we did the pilot, and it worked very well. <coughs> so that's how it started. We've, so we've done, tried in a small district, gone to a larger scale. And the larger scale in the province we had a meeting here which actually showed that the system was good, acceptable by the people in the province, 
and they overwhelmingly recommended this system to be rolled out in the whole country. And uh, this was the biggest task, because we are talking of training all health workers in the country, or at least those who will be working on the system, making sure they have internet access, and making sure they even get laptops. So it was quite a task. But we were prepared to take the task because we had very competent technical assistance and also the support, the financial support was quite ready, readily available. So we took the process and we thought the best approach was to think of training at a casket level, train TOTs who will eventually take the training to a lower level and then the issue of importing the old data also came up, so we had way, a way of getting the old data from the other system to bring it in the, the DHIS so that we can make some comparative, compa compa comparatives. Then we also, as we were training, the issue of supportive supervision actually came up, that it's, DHIS is not a very good system to train in class. It's more practical and people read the theories but then they forget, so you really need to constantly work with the people on the ground, literally show them this is how it's done, and people forget. I've always blamed the ICT people because they think very fast. They just tell you click, 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 but you don't know why you are clicking. <laughs> so, so that kind of aspect of training, we need that. And some people, especially some of us Kenyans, we are not really willing to look stupid. <laughs> so when you say, have you understood, I just say yes, because I don't want to appear a little bit stupid in front of you. So most of the people we realize in the classroom aspect were just saying yes, have you understood yes, so that you move on and maybe they go for her, for their tea and anything like that. So it's when you went back to them, they now openly told you that by the way, how, how are we reaching there? Then you go back and say, me you didn't hear when you went to class, say ah, I didn't want to disturb the class but I knew one day <laughs> we'll be that and go through. So this is what has been happening with supportive supervision. And it's very much encouraged, and I hope the other countries are doing that, that they need to constantly go to the people they have trained in a classroom session to see that they, you remind them. And when you remind them repeatedly, then they'll now at least remember. We've also been trying to have stakeholders meetings. We had quite a number, especially some of the meetings which involve how we can get away from the parallel system into one system. And these meetings are still going ongoing and we hope we'll come up with one health information system. We also did, <coughs> we purchased laptops, and again there is also a bit of story about the laptops. Again, with my good friend, Professor Bra, we visited somewhere in this province, and the district health records officer's office was down the hill. <coughs> now this time water is not going up here. <laughs> but was a bit, the office was lower, so we decided with our laptops, I think, we walked up under the mango tree and the internet was very high, but in his office there was no internet. So we said, fine, but you know, you can't keep on moving the desktop to go and enter the data in the mango tree. <laughs> <laughs> so we would rather procure laptops, give to them so that they can actually walk where there's full internet and enter. Or other than just going under the mango tree, they could also maybe when they are traveling to see their friends in Mombasa where the internet was high, carry their forms, do their data entry there, and go back. And by that time, we did not have this facility of off, offline entry. So that now, that, that we were just thinking, you go, enter the data, and then come back. But now that we've got a, a chance to enter data entry, I think things have slightly changed and slightly much better. So that's how we thought of buying <coughs> laptops to districts so that they can actually manage their own idea and also we've been supporting them from their own with the airtime. Uh, 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 this is just a picture of myself and in a district trying to just go through with the people some of the things we had taught them, some of the reminders and as I told you, you found out there's quite a lot of gap from classroom to real work. So when, when you go with them little by little, they actually understand and they appreciate. And now they don't feel that bad, then they couldn't raise their hand when they were alone in class. 
So this will be what you are there also. You are always with me. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, we'll talk about uh, what, what we said. As of now, all the districts in this country are reporting through DHS. And everybody's just, the users can easily log in and be able to get their, to enter their data. And we've actually finally closed the old system that we were using. And generally people have said the software is good. The word I kept on hearing is user-friendly. I don't know how the other one was <coughs> unfriendly, but the question of it being user-friendly is the catch one I've had everywhere I go that the, the system is user-friendly. And we in due course, we are thinking that we can actually get rid of the parallel system, not in a bad way, but in a friendly way, because the, the software is user-friendly, in a friendly way so that we all have one reporting system. And this is a picture of we took during the national launch. The reason I flashed this picture is to show you one of the reasons we've really succeeded is that we had a lot of political or ministry support in the system. The Director of Public Health, who promised to be here, has been very, very supportive. He actually is also technically highly, highly technical. He's the one who logs in every day. And uh, th this a day, he told me a story, I've never told anybody this. <clears throat> he was showing his friends how DHIS is. And then he logged in something which is supposed to be numbers. Let's say number of women doing this and this. And then on his screen, he saw the number was 40.2. Then he said, surely since when did it become 40.2? So he decided to tell them just 40. And then he kept the point two because luckily they were not looking at the screen. So he, told, he called me immediately, how many, how can we have 40.2 people? <laughs> then he said, okay, I didn't tell them, but I, I was feeling bad if they were watching, then they would have said the system is bad from the world. So I told him, oh, occasionally we get some problems, some small bugs, where are we, but we'll fix that. And it was, it, 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 it's, it's, it's not annoyed, but he's actually protecting the system because he's, he's making it more user-friendly to the others. So he, he logs on every day, he tells you, can I get my immunization report for this? And he just checks. And he says that he does not want me to give him data because maybe I might cheat. <laughs> so it's him to, to get his data. So he's really been supportive. And that is the permanent secretary and the ambassador of uh, the day. Yeah. They will actually now officially launch this as the system for the country. So this, the importance of this slide is just to show that there is a lot of political support. And where they support, then things will move. Even when we suggest that we are going to have a meeting in Mombasa, international meeting, we don't have any problems because if it's DHIS, let it be, let it go on. Because they are also very proud to have a system that they can really click and get their results wherever they are on their uh, mobile or something like that. I want this, no more calling that they give me this, bring for me this. So that is the national launch. And a bit of experiences, uh, what I would say is that the DHIS is able to give some simple analysis for the people at the lower level. They just say, oh my, this time I'm moving, this time I'm improving. And this actually promotes what we call data use at the user at the time of data entry. And we've actually put in some inbuilt data entry checks, which actually also improve and eventually will have data quality being checked by this validation rule. And we can say there's a bit of improved in dissemination of public health information. We have a guest account which can allow the public to view some data and they can actually be able to know where the, we have a lot of malaria more than the other place, something like that. So at least it, dissemination of information is becoming much easier. And by that, we can also say it can also help to strengthen the monitoring of some outbreaks. It might be easy to see it timely, just wondering why we have a very big chart like this. For example, at one time, somebody put in by mistake in one province where he put a lot of uh, millions of ear infections. 
So it was easily picked up, say, the leading cause of infection, ear infection. So, hey, somebody said, there must be an outbreak. Can we make some money there? We rush there and make some money on the, start treating people's ears. But then finally, we, we found it was a small mistake. So you can easily pick up anything that is coming out and that is, I, I wanted to, uh, my, my colleague can, slash for, can put for me just a top 10 leading, just escape and put. Yeah, this, I, 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 I'll be talking about that I use, and uh, as I, I put up this slide, I'm moving towards some of the challenges we face. If you look at this, is the chart for Kenya showing the leading diseases in Kenya as of May from our DHIS, and these are numbers. So you can look, if you, if you start wondering, the leading cause of problems in outpatient is called other diseases of respiratory diseases. Other, so you know you are starting with other, so what is the main? Then you look at the next one, all other diseases is the second, and then they followed by clinical malaria, Diseases of the skin, we don't know what those are. And then confirmed malaria, then diarrhea, pneumonia, and then, then <coughs> they finally accidents. <coughs> so what, what I'm saying is that if you look at this, anybody who is learned will start saying, why should we start with the other and not the, the main? So that means some of our data collection tools may actually be defective. They are only collecting minor things like plague, which may no longer be in this country or collecting other diseases that may not necessarily be important. So that leads straight away to thinking, what are we going to do to our reporting forms? And that brings to the biggest challenge that we have actually to transform in order to fit in this. Because now we are already exposing our weaknesses straight away to the public. Because somebody will ask you if, the way we, you remember some of us as doctors, one day we made a strike, we were saying, Doctors are living in the servant quarters of the of, our, of the tenants. So who are these tenants? If doctors used to be the most educated, how come then they are living in the servant quarters? And so who are these other people who are, who are like this? So this other disease is actually like, it's supposed to be not even there. So that means we should re make sure that our forms are able to capture the real diseases, and then these others are actually out. But of importance is accidents. If you look at our form, it has consistently shown that accidents in this country are among the top leading causes of outpatient diseases. This is actually true. And that means if you are in the public health, it's important to pick up an accident, something which is very easily preventable. Pick it up and say, I think I'm going to do something to accidents so that they don't form part of the top 10. And I don't think it's the correct in your country. Would accident be? Um, yeah. yeah, so you see, straight away you can pick up that something wrong. The rheumatism and joint pains is okay because our population is also growing a little bit older. And so that, if it comes there, it's, I have no problem with it. Urinary tract infections, maybe that could have be a problem, but pneumonia. So these are the things we are saying. You can look at it and see what can you make of this information. What challenges do you see? What public health actions can we actually take? And that is, so now we can move on to the slides. Okay, so I, I just wanted to show you as we move on, what are some of the, that was an outpatient report. That the first one I showed you was the outpatient the causes of outpatient diseases, but I would also like to show you that from that form, these were the reporting rates for that particular form of the same month, and it is quite high. Coast province are close to 100%. Uh, Kazungu is here, so it, it, you, I would like you to ask him whether is it true that every, everybody is feeling it up to 100%. Nairobi is a bit low, and uh, central is a bit low, but at least generally, we are saying our reporting rates for most of our diseases is 80 percent, and that is quite something. If if we improve the reporting rates, the next thing we now to strive is to improve the the data quality, and then we can say we've really achieved. 
Okay, fine. So we are. We want to talk just some of the things we've noted. We know that due to the central server being being served in one place and being web based, any small change that you make is actually able to be seen by the user. So if, if someone <coughs> complains, we just make a change and it is fixed. I think I always get a, an email from Lars that when you tell him something, then he just say fixed. Meaning, yeah, when he fix, says it, it fixes the whole country. <laughs> so, so, so that is one, one, one aspect that he, when he fixes it, he doesn't need to come again to Kenya to fix it. He doesn't need to go to Uganda to fix it. So it is fixed. <laughs> and it goes all around. And then also the cloud-based technology is interesting because somehow, though we have our data very easily done, we kind of don't have a lot of strain on knowing whether there's a blackout, whether there is somebody on duty or has gone to a funeral. So a bit of that strain has been removed. But of course, one day, we can't say we've done away with it, but it's something that it has been of use. And then the use of laptops, I think I put it clearly that some places have fluctuating network, and this makes people can go with their laptops because when we are using the offline technology, they can actually log on with the, with the internet and go away and enter their data at their own time. And we would like to note that the availability of these technical assistance has been of great use. I've just talked of last saying fixed. He doesn't say fixed when he's in Kenya, it's when he's still in Oslo. So he's been of use. They're able to fix most of these things even off hours when they're not in our country. And they form part of our success story in the, in the rapid launch. And some of the things I've, I've put this clearly that initially we did not have an offline data entry ability, but now we do. And this has really quite unknown. A lot of people are able to enter data when they are off. And then when the internet comes, data is normally there. And also the fact that reports are technically generated at night when they are asleep. So any time you click, the report comes very quickly. This encourages people because they don't need to wait for the, the, the reports to be formed at the, at the real time. So these are some of the things that have made people, I think that's why they're telling us that this system is user-friendly. And I, I'll just put one or two challenges, which of course everybody starts with the connectivity, there are areas still we may not have very high internet and we also may not have even electricity for the laptops that we are providing. They are there, but the goodness with Kenya, those of you who are, who are here in Kenya, if you happen to buy the local line and try to ring, you will actually find out that Kenya is the cheapest in mobile. I think it's the cheapest, eh? because to ring to America is three shillings per minute, to ring to any other country. So, this has really helped us. The fact that it's very cheap to call from Kenya, thanks to the mobile wars, the air, the air terms, <laughs> they have really fought until actually they are not making profit. The only people making profit is us who are able to communicate. <laughs> so they are, they are really, really down, and that that has helped us so much. So connectivity is a problem. We talk about capacity uh, and. Uh, a lot of people in this country, especially some managers, may have very little knowledge of the computers. We say they are called BBA, born before. Is it BBA or BBC? BBC. They were born before computers. <laughs> so, so some of them are in that region and they, they become a bit difficult. Even if you tell them click this and this, they still want the old style of come bring me the data. So we really need to improve in this capacity building aspect. And uh, the other challenge is stakeholders. We know we are welcoming all the stakeholders, but again, you may find their needs are too large that again, there's a possibility of not being able to, to, to be accommodated. And that can risk the idea of overload and therefore again say, we are not meeting our demands, therefore we can go away. So we have to handle the stakeholders with a lot of care to see that it's well done. And also money, the capital issue is there. We were well supported by donors. We also want to think as a government that we need to start chipping in some things. 
there's this talk every day of sustainability. It's, you can't wish it away. So it needs to be brought up that eventually we may need to use our own resources to make sure that these programs work. And I've just put you one of the challenges we need to review our reporting tools. And this is normally a very, very tall order. Because that would mean everybody comes together, we agree on the tools, and then you repeat all the reporting tools, the whole country. And if there is one single mistake that you have to reprint, it's, it, it's, it's a challenge and we have to. We have to face this because we've seen that some of the tools we have may not be may not be tenable for the rest of the time. And in conclusion, I just want to make, we made a very bold move to go large scale. And the DHIS deployment was really successful and basically because of the good attributes of the DHIS itself and the support from stakeholders. And this success actually prove that a web-based system using central server with the universal access can be appropriate for Africa. And as I still put it that even though we have done very well, we still need to have capacity building to have the relevant infrastructure and the staff if this system has to work well. And uh, I took this picture in uh, Zambia stroke Zimbabwe because they don't know where it really belongs. <laughs> The, the, so, but the idea is that the DHIS is like this false. It has started going down and we cannot afford to return it up. So let us, <laughs> let us move with it. And uh, finally, I just want to thank you. This is the ministry headquarters where we work, most of us, and it's called Afia House. Thank you very much. Very interesting story, I guess.